Hello, my name is Christina Davis. I'm the director of the program on US-Japan relations at Harvard University. I'm very excited to invite those of you joining us from Tokyo, our guest speakers, and those of us in Boston, to a discussion about economic policy agenda for the Indo-Pacific region. We're going to be talking about one of the most important themes as the world economy is in a difficult period and the hope is that once again, Asia Pacific is an engine of growth and can surge forward with leadership to help us restore prosperity for East Asia as well as for the world. And for me as a scholar who's often looked at Japanese trade policy, it's really still quite remarkable to think that Japan is in the leadership role. It often seemed that Japan was the reactive state that was the last to come to the table to negotiate opening markets. And yet, when the Trump administration pulled the US out of trade agreements, threatened that the WTO was a disaster, Japan stood up, took leadership, establishing the Comprehensive Progressive Agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership, which is a major new trade agreement in setting new standards and bringing together countries. Japan stood by the World Trade Organization, pushing forward innovative reform proposals, trying to get the US to remain engaged. And this is really a important time where there are many free trade agreements in East Asia beyond the CPTPP. We've now seen the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. We've seen the first US-Japan bilateral free trade agreement and a new Indo-Pacific economic framework for prosperity. Even someone like myself studying trade gets a little confused with all of these agreements. But one common feature is that Japan is actually at the center of all of them. And so it's important for those of us interested in US-Japan relations to think about how the relationship between the US and Japan can push forward on a free trade agenda while acknowledging that many in the world have seen problems with free trade and are questioning it. And is there a possibility for a new balance that allows more adjustment for declining sectors, that engages with the innovation of the digital economy, takes into account the need to develop sustainable development with attention to environmental issues? Is that too much ambition? And to take on this ambitious trade agenda while in the middle of a trade war is even a greater challenge. US-China tensions have led to an incredibly heightened level of economic conflict with sanctions over a large share of the bilateral trade relation, new measures restricting US high technology exports to China. And even amidst all of this acrimony, there's still hope that competition can allow these countries to develop together. The most recent sign of hope was that there was a summit meeting between US President Biden and Chinese President Xi Jinping, followed a few days later by a summit meeting between Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida, where Kishida and Xi were able to look friendly and refer to a constructive, stable Japan-China relationship expectations that China would follow a rule-based order. So we can see there's a possibility for negotiations going forward, but it won't be easy. And so as we think about this agenda, what is the role for the US-Japan relationship and why should we be thinking of this broader Indo-Pacific region that goes beyond the US and Japan and tries to engage with India? long hesitant on free trade deals. And is there containment of China or will there be a possibility for competitive cooperation? Well, in order to navigate these very difficult topics, we are fortunate to have two of the key officials negotiating these issues from Tokyo and they're all joining us from Tokyo. Our first speaker is Aaron Forsberg. He's the Minister Counselor for Economic and Scientific Affairs at the US Embassy in Tokyo. He's a career member of the Senior Foreign Service who entered the Department of State in 2001. He's worked at the Japan Desk Economic Unit, Chief in the State Department's East Asia Pacific Affairs. 
He's also done quite a bit of work on aviation issues, working in the Office of Aviation Negotiations Bureau of Economic and Business Affairs. In a remarkable accomplishment during the COVID pandemic, he created the model for commercial rescue flights, which were used to enable US embassies coordinating with US airlines and foreign airlines to bring home Americans who'd been stranded overseas when borders closed down. So we know we have a top diplomat if he can do both trade negotiations and help rescue people on the right airlines in the midst of a pandemic. Even more remarkable is actually Aaron Forsberg has a PhD from the University of Texas at Austin and is the author of a book, America and Japanese Miracle, the Cold War Context of Japan's Post-War Economic Revival, 1950 to 1960. I highly recommend the book. It's really been a great inspiration for much of my own research. It looks reflectively back at how the Cold War grand strategy shaped the way the US and Japan cooperated, making the US more willing to offer concessions to help contribute to the prosperity of Japan. And we have to wonder in the new Cold War, how different relations between the US and China as rivals will be when they're trying to negotiate trade and they don't quite have that positive security relationship that helped to ease many of the difficulties between America and Japan back in the 1950s. So we'll ask uh, Aaron to go back to his scholarly days and bring it forward to the current period we see today. Our second speaker, Roku Ichiro Michi-san, does not really need an introduction to our audience in Boston because before becoming ambassador and deputy chief negotiator for TPP and the cabinet secretary, his current job in Japan, he was the consulate general in Boston for the years 2016 to 2019. We were really thrilled that he would join the events for the program on US-Japan relations. Um, I, in particular, am grateful to him for speaking with me fondly about how wonderful Boston is as a city and encouraging me to come and choose to live here and work at Harvard. Michi-san has had a long career in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. He is the he has worked both in the cabinet office now on TPP, and before that, he works in the Director General of the Economic Affairs Bureau. He was Assistant Vice Minister for the Ministry of Justice, and has also worked on other tough issues related to immigration, and taken his hand at writing, just to show that all diplomats uh, must also become scholars from time to time. He's published in a Japanese international law outlet an article on international legal framework for liability compensation for damage from nuclear accidents. We are really thrilled to have these two experts joining us. This seminar is part of the special series on policy innovations and crises supported by a grant from the Japan Foundation. It is co-sponsored by the Harvard Asia Center the Mosavar Ramani Center for Business and Government at the Kennedy School, and the Harvard Undergraduate Japan Policy Network. Before we go straight to our event, let's look at what is coming up next week. Japan, Germany, and Eurasia's security crises with Masashi Murano and Thomas Berger. We hope you can join us next week. And I'll remind you of, um, we're going to have this event recorded and we ask that you hold your questions until our speakers finish, at which time you can either raise your hand in the, or ask a question in the chat as you prefer. Well, I'd like to turn over, uh, Aaron, if you could get us started. Uh, well, thank you very much for that uh, gracious introduction. Um, and thank you for pulling up the slides. Uh, I trust you can hear me. I take oh. that as a yes. Oh, yes. yes. I was um, muted when I said yes. <laughs> OK. Um, and um, I, I, I do wish to speak uh, both uh, from the perspective of a sitting a US government official um, with uh, uh, some uh, drawing on some of my uh, academic background uh, to try to uh, distill uh, today uh, what I believe uh, US policy is and what US-Japan cooperation uh, in forging an economic agenda for the Indo-Pacific region is. There's been a lot of commentary about what the uh, various initiatives such as the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework might, uh, might not be, um, but I think for the audience, it's very important to understand 
uh, what it is the governments are attempting to do and what that means for the region. So uh, I hope to tie things together. If you could uh, move to the next slide, please. Uh, and what I seek to do uh, to achieve that end in a relatively limited time covering a very large expanse of issues is to highlight the uh, shared priorities and values uh, of both governments uh, reflected in the uh, commitments uh, to democracy of their people uh, and uh, to pose the policy questions that uh, the uh, figures uh, in both uh, Washington and Tokyo are posing, and then to show how we are seeking to address these policy questions uh, and uh, what that means for uh, the issues in focus uh, for the region. Uh, if you could move to the next slide, please. Uh, to begin, however, I'd like to uh, highlight a little bit of context uh, over the last 10 years or so. Uh, in particular, uh, for the United States, um, uh, economic policy and trade policy especially were under pressure. Uh, for many, as uh, you had noted, uh, there was a sense that things were not going as well as desired. Uh, and for policymakers, uh, that old tools were not adequate to present needs. And so even before the pandemic, uh, Japan, the United States, like other advanced economies, uh, were experiencing slower growth, uh, continuing technological disruption, uh, rising rates of inequality. Uh, I would highly recommend uh, the uh, book, uh, The Revolt of the Public and the Crisis of Authority to uh, the audience to understand how that discontent uh, with uh, things not going as, as desired uh, with new technology uh, made possible by the digital revolution uh, combined to, to really upend politics uh, as we saw in the middle of the decade. Uh, I would highlight that Gurry wrote this prior to Brexit, prior to the advent uh, of Trump, uh, has since uh, reissued the book, but uh, there was uh, new ways for uh, the public to um, involve uh, a, a wider set of issues and policy debates, uh, which complicated jobs for, for policymakers. Uh, and uh, the thought leaders themselves, uh, the economists who had championed free trade and globalizations had second thoughts in particular as they assessed the impact of competition from China following the uh, entry of the PRC into the um, uh, World Trade Organization. Uh, and when that uh, economic competition hit in slower economic times, in particular the Great Recession uh, period, uh, the political fallout was greater. So uh, Michael Hirsch summarizes this well in an article I cite there. Uh, and then came uh, the pandemic, uh, which uh, interrupted uh, travel, uh, making uh, policymaking harder, making it harder to meet, making it harder to do business to, uh, for investors to meet face-to-face -face for those critical deals. Uh, and we see this in, in air, air travel statistics. Uh, I was in the middle of that uh, from, a, from a different angle, um, but uh, the pandemic also laid bare some inequalities in our own society uh, in Japan and other countries uh, and uh, in policy under both the prime minister uh, Kishida and president Biden, we see growing attention to inclusiveness, uh, economic justice, um, serving underserved communities, uh, and uh, as a result of the uh, pandemic, the war, other disasters, uh, there are new uncertainties that have also complicated the policymaking environment. So uh, the context is a very different world uh, than existed only a few years ago. Next slide, please. Um, and um, when uh, we want to uh, understand this, what US policy is, uh, I think uh, I want to channel my uh, fellow uh, diplomats work, uh, the efforts of lawmakers who are following foreign policy, and of course the leaders uh, to highlight uh, the priorities that we share and how both governments have attempted uh, to put forth a positive economic vision for the Indo-Pacific uh, that benefits the countries uh, and their peoples. And I've summarized here in five priorities uh, ideas that are useful, I think, for making sense of the many, many initiatives out there uh, that really cast a wider net than economic and trade policy as we have usually conceived of it. Uh, the first is a rules-based international order uh, that uh, amounts to defense of the world uh, trading system and the world uh, uh, international order 
that provides for or can provide for a level playing field uh, and an opportunity for nations to prosper. Um, to keying off of the concerns about uh, inequalities, uh, I think one sees a, a, a consistent focus on inclusive growth uh, and more attention to distribution issues, not just generation of wealth. Uh, in our policy. Uh, economic security is a relatively new phrase. Uh, it can mean different things in different contexts, from cybersecurity to uh, ensuring an adequate food supply. Uh, but a secure economy that continues to provide is a very important uh, element uh, that unites many policies. Um, resilience is a word you will often hear. Uh, what this means, I think, in practical terms is making sure that supply chains continue to function, continue to be connected. Uh, and can manage the shocks that uh, have in uh, recent years uh, occasionally broken them. Uh, and finally, sustainability. Uh, by this, I mean decarbonization and uh, uh, economy that is geared to increasingly uh, lower greenhouse gas emissions so as to reduce uh, the um, not only the reality, but also the harms of global warming. Um, when Prime Minister Kishida welcomed President Biden to Japan in uh, uh, May of this year, uh, one point he made uh, when the two leaders were talking to the public was to highlight how uh, the policies we put forward are sh grounded in a shared commitment to universal values of freedom, democracy, human rights, and the rule of law. And I think that uh, we took for granted many of uh, these commitments while, um, certainly while I was coming of age professionally, uh, but in the view of the challenges to them, uh, forthright defense of them is certainly part of what we see in both countries' policies. Uh, if you could move to the next slide, please. Um, the um, policies, I think, uh, can be understood uh, very well in uh, terms of being a response to challenge, a response to uh, uh, new circumstances, and uh, in a quick word, threats to uh, what we are att attempting to achieve uh, by building an order that enables uh, not just our two countries, but also our trading partners to, um, to prosper and to thrive. Uh, and uh, in this, uh, I would highlight uh, the uh, threats to um, just a functioning wor wor world um, system, uh, whether it's uh, on the side of uh, international organizations doing their job or uh, following the rules. The most brazen and most dramatic challenge to this was Russia's uh, unprovoked invasion of Ukraine, uh, weaponization of uh, exports, uh, energy exports in particular. Um, but we see this uh, economic uh, coercion uh, previously uh, in uh, conduct by uh, the People's Republic of China uh, toward other countries occasionally, uh, beginning really with Japan in 2010 uh, after a dispute with the Senkakus, the uh, cutoff of rare earth elements ushered in uh, what in retrospect was a new era of uh, challenge to uh, order and fair play as we understand it. Um, I won't, don't plan to talk at length about technology, but forced technology transfer is certainly uh, the kind of non-market uh, trade policy or economic practice uh, that uh, we seek to counter as well. Um, and uh, reviewing some of the others, which I've, I've highlighted uh, already, uh, sh attempting to better serve the needs of underserved communities. Uh, those who did not prosper in the last three decades, uh, attempting uh, to grapple with the uh, insecurity uh, flowing from the pandemic and health risk, uh, the energy and, and food insecurity that uh, is unfortunately a political fallout of the war in Ukraine. Uh, I don't need to say much about supply chains because everybody has experienced disruption of some kind, uh, but it's front and center in terms of policy. Um, but uh, it's really more than that. I think if we look ahead, uh, there is a strategic competition between the United States and China for leadership in new foundational technologies. I'm speaking of uh, artificial intelligence, biotechnology, quantum information science and technology. Uh, and uh, that's uh, a, um, a challenge uh, really with at stake uh, who will uh, be able to build the uh, industries of the future going forward. And finally, uh, the climate in crisis is something that uh, the uh, two governments have really uh, focused on. And I think that this was actually the issue that the Biden administration began with first. Uh, and if I look at uh, Prime Minister Suga, 
uh, and his leadership uh, declaring carbon neutrality as a um, goal for 2050 uh, was quite new. Uh, next slide, please. I've actually previewed a lot of this, but this is the slide where uh, I asked the question, what does this add up to for an economic policy agenda for the Indo-Pacific uh, region? Uh, and I would summarize uh, it as follows, which flows from uh, much of what I've said uh, so far. Uh, a strong defense of the rules-based uh, economic order uh, internationally uh, with a view to uh, countering economic coercion, to attempting to uh, ensure fair play, a level playing field. Uh, and we see this as well with uh, lending uh, techniques, which I can talk about more in Q&A, but uh, highlighting unfair and opaque lending, uh, as we've seen uh, with uh, unfortunate consequences in the case of Sri Lanka recently. Uh, pursuit of uh, inclusive economic growth internationally. This is in some ways a reflection of uh, our two leaders' uh, domestic uh, programs, uh, which seek uh, to uh, aim for better distribution. Uh, and uh, front and center for the uh, United States and Japan together is the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, uh, which I think you've read about, so I will leave that there, but the four pillars uh, are uh, something that build out uh, in each in its own way, uh, these other uh, priorities as well, promotion of economic security uh, with a uh, focus on um, health, uh, not in the IPEF, but the United States and Japan are doing a great deal together. I'd like to highlight the Global Fund, which uh, had its seventh replenishment in September. Uh, Japan contributed over a uh, billion dollars, the United States as well. Uh, this is to fight HIV, uh, AIDS, malaria, and tuberculosis. Um, it is um, part of the economic picture, even if it's not trade. Uh, energy and food, keeping uh, the energy uh, markets functional, keeping food flowing uh, via trade uh, are uh, items that we committed, for example, in the ministerial declaration on the emergency response to food security earlier this year. Uh, supply chain resilience uh, gets its own pillar in the Indo-Pacific economic framework, and as does decarbonization and green transition. Um, the uh, competitiveness and resilience partnership or core partnership, uh, which was first announced in uh, April of 2021, uh, highlights some of the activities that the two governments are doing in this respect. Uh, next slide, please. And um, I think uh, that as a U.S. government speaker, uh, it would be helpful for me to point to a couple of drivers on the U.S. side uh, here uh, for the audience uh, that I believe set the current era apart from what came before. Uh, and I think if you remember nothing else from uh, this presentation, it would be the integration of domestic and foreign policy, uh, really a domestic economic policy and geopolitical strategy to prioritize economic growth uh, with focus on benefits for workers and for the middle class. It's not just about aggregate growth. Um, and our uh, team in uh, the Biden administration had actually uh, previewed this in a Carnegie publication, Making U.S. Foreign Policy Work Better for the Middle Class, which I cite here. Uh, but uh, I would also point you to the National Security Strategy, uh, which memorializes this uh, in the United States um, a case. Uh, and I highlight national security strategy because that's not usually where trade and economic policy uh, guidance has been most clearly set out. Uh, but I think that this is uh, in some respects, a different era, uh, precisely uh, due to the nature of the threats we face and how we're attempting to grapple with them. Um, the policy focus on industrial base and supply chains uh, is also something that I would highlight. Uh, I have here a quote from the uh, authors of the 100-day report under uh, the uh, supply chain executive order that Prime, uh, excuse me, President Biden issued in uh, February of 20, uh, 2021. Um, and it highlights uh, that whereas for the last 30 years we have pursued efficiency and cost in our supply chains, uh, risks that resulted uh, have uh, prompted a shift to focus more on security, sustainability, and resilience, which are words I attempted to highlight earlier in this presentation. Uh, and finally, um, in addition to the emphasis on strategic competition, 
I would also highlight the importance that the uh, Biden administration and 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 I believe the Kishida government as well uh, place on strengthening alliances and partnerships. Uh, this is memorialized in the national security strategy for the U.S. side, uh, and is really uh, I think what the president sees is one of the great strengths uh, that the United States has to offer uh, its partners uh, in the world is uh, the uh, the network. Uh, that comes with uh, the shared commitment to these uh, policy ends. Next slide, please. So in sum, um, I think that um, it's it's helpful to think of the U.S.-Japan relationship in relation to the Indo-Pacific region as a new economic partnership for a new era. Uh, we are not talking about uh, bilateral trade friction as the dominant theme. Uh, we are talking about a partnership and delivering prosperity and security for our own peoples, but also for our partners. Uh, we're doing this by addressing new challenges and threats. Um, a few words on some uh, architecture for the way we hope to do this going forward. Um, the uh, Economic um, Policy Consultative Committee, or sometimes called an Economic 2 plus 2, uh, which launched last uh, July when uh, ministers Hayashi and uh, um, Hagiuda visited Washington, um, we really elevated economic policy to the strategic level to match the security and foreign uh, two plus two that had been a staple of the US-Japan relationship for a long time. Uh, in addition, Japan will host the G7 uh, and uh, the United States will host APEC in 2023. I think you will see some of these themes highlighted in those uh, the, those proceedings uh, as we seek to lead together. Uh, and of course, we are working on new initiatives such as the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, working together in international organizations, uh, not to mention companies, but country-specific uh, efforts. Uh, and in, in respect to uh, where this sits in the long historical trend, I think there is a reflection of uh, change uh, in the trading system and that the United States and Japan's combined share of global GDP is smaller. Uh, we need to work together. Uh, we want to work together. Uh, and we are. We're the largest source of investment in each other. And our shared interests and values stand out more apparently as common dangers loom larger. Next slide, please. Uh, to close, uh, I want to... Um, uh, note that uh, I think it's fair to say that we live in an inflection point in history where a new configuration of uh, both new challenges as well as uh, ones we have long known uh, call uh, together uh, for new policy responses. Um, Ambassador Emanuel is often one to say we cannot go back to what was before. There is no reset button. Uh, what we are creating will be something new. And uh, the questions I leave you with, uh, as you will be writing uh, the history, or at least some of the present on this, um, for consideration are um, as follows. Um, what are the needs that our policies and, and our diplomacy should address? What substantively needs to be done? Uh, what are the best tools to address those needs in the uh, present world? And um, how can we best demonstrate together, the United States and Japan, the benefits of a rules-based international order to uh, the wider Indo-Pacific region? Um, we have uh, presented some answers with our policies uh, and um, I'm humble enough to know uh, that they're not the last word. There's a lot, uh, a lot to happen before uh, as we look ahead. And uh, with that, I will close and I'll happily take questions at the, uh, at the appropriate time. Thank you very much. Thank you for a fascinating presentation. You show the complexity of economic policy agenda, which long required looking at geopolitics and strategy, but now also requires looking at middle class economic demands and needs, and I'm sure makes the job of being the negotiator even more complicated. We're going to turn now to the uh, negotiator from the Japanese perspective, and we look forward to hearing uh, from Rokuichiro Michi-san. Um, okay, thank you very much. And uh, uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, Professor Davis and uh, uh, everybody. It's really uh, great to get reconnected uh, uh, with uh, Boston and the Harvard community. And uh, I'm very grateful for this opportunity. 
And uh, so, um, yeah, let me just uh, uh, start after Arun San's wonderful presentation. Um, I will talk about, uh, okay, let's see. Um, can you actually uh, see this slice? Oh, sorry. Not yet. Oh, sorry. What's happening? Oh, okay. Now we can okay. see. Oh, okay, yeah, thank you very much. Yes. Um, yes. Uh, yeah, I work for the, the Japanese government and uh, uh, of course, uh, Japanese, po yeah, what I talk about based on the Japanese government official sort of uh, agenda policy, but sometimes uh, uh, some of the observation uh, may be just uh, my personal view and please just uh, yeah, uh, allow me uh, to do that. And uh, um, actually uh, the priorities and the challenges uh, which we face now uh, has been uh, elegantly explained by uh, our own son, uh, US embassy. So I decided not to, to repeat that part, but uh, uh, I am going to talk about uh, uh, actually from especially trade side, what actually we have been doing uh, nowadays. And uh, so that uh, you can know what's happening uh, 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 actually inside the government and uh, then uh, see. Um, sorry, quickly, this is yeah uh, about uh, myself and uh, um, many years ago uh, when I was in Washington, uh, Pentagon was the place where I almost daily visited and talk about all these uh, Base issues and the maintenance management of US Japan uh, security arrangement. And uh, then 2002, uh, this photo uh, is in Yangon, uh, Burma. And uh, it's me uh, 20 years ago, but that's not important. The a person who is sitting uh, right next to me is uh, Aung San Suu Kyi. And, uh, at that time, she uh, came out, but unfortunately, she got arrested again, and uh, so uh, history repeats. It's very unfortunate. Then uh, down right is uh, uh, my time in Moscow. Uh, that was during the first Ukraine crisis, and it was really interesting to see what's happening from the inside. But uh, today, uh, of course, uh, my focus is my uh, current uh, assignment and uh, uh, which is uh, economic and trade negotiation. And uh, um, just as a sort of background, let me briefly uh, talk about uh, uh, how actually Japan have, uh, has built uh, what sort of uh, uh, trade policy. Actually, it goes back to even uh, uh, goes to uh, 1950s when we first opened up a uh, uh, country and uh, uh, the first treaty we negotiated and uh, concluded was uh, with the United States Treaty of sort of friendship commerce navigation and it lasted uh, at, until a certain uh, time after the World War II. Uh, the rights and ob obligations from a current point of view are not sharply defined, but uh, that was a sort of a base sort of a base framework. Then after the World War II, on top of that, we started to, to uh, uh, come up with several uh, package of bilateral uh, sort of uh, economic tool like uh, taxation treaty, investment treaty, social security treaty. Uh, for example, uh, in 1950, Three, the first uh, sort of uh, uh, devised uh, friendship commerce navigation treaty was concluded with the United States. Then uh, 1963, the first uh, taxation treaty with Australia. 1978, first uh, investment treaty with Egypt. And uh, 2000, uh, we concluded a uh, uh, sort of social security treaty with Germany. And ever since, we actually uh, sort of uh, tried to, to expand these networks. Then uh, 
concurrently, uh, when we enter 1970s, uh, 60s, 70s, 80s, it was uh, remembered as a sort of a difficult time for a uh, trade dispute. And uh, uh, well, at that time, probably Japanese policy was uh, as uh, Professor Davis described uh, more reactive. And we tried to, to come up with uh, various sort of uh, uh, mechanism, mechanism to settle, let's say, automobile dispute or semiconductor dispute and things so on. Then uh, early 90, uh, 90s, in 1993, if you remember, Uruguay, Uruguay round of WTO was concluded. And uh, that was really, really uh, epoch making for us. We opened up uh, the uh, agricultural sector. And uh, uh, basically, uh, we entered the time of WTO primacy. So we uh, most opt for uh, multilateral rule based uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, economic policy. And that has been sort of uh, uh, our, has, well, uh, key sort of concept for us. And because of that, probably uh, we are slightly late to join the, this, uh, uh, the effort of uh, uh, free trade agreement. And, uh, but we started uh, the first uh, free trade agreement Japan and concluded was with Singapore year 2002. And uh, ever since we have uh, in, sort of expanded this uh, uh, network of free trade agreement. And uh, that is where we are now. And right now, uh, because of partly because of COVID, we face various new challenges and how to cope with, respond to these uh, challenges like uh, protectionism uh, or anti-globalism or various issues as uh, Aaron San uh, explained is a uh, uh, key sort of uh, uh, challenge for us. Now, uh, this is uh, where we are now. Uh, in terms of uh, economic uh, framework, FTA, Japanese sometimes call it uh, Economic Partnership Agreement, EPA, essentially the same as FTA. And uh, in terms of total trade, uh, Japanese uh, FTA networks covers our 80% uh, of our uh, total uh, trade. So uh, we really based on this uh, uh, network of FTAs. And uh, uh, as you can see, it's centering around, uh, well, of course, uh, Southeast Asia and uh, uh, North and South America, then uh, in Europe. And uh, that's how we built our uh, trade network. Then today, I just would like to uh, focus on uh, among various FTAs, TPP, because this is currently probably uh, in a real sense uh, the only ongoing sort of uh, uh, negotiation uh, taking place. Uh, of course, uh, there are uh, negotiation for revising existing bilateral FTAs, uh, but uh, uh, in a true sense, uh, TPP is the one uh, which uh, we are fully sort of uh, uh, engaging uh, in terms of uh, uh, legal framework. And uh, uh, as you can see, uh, this is uh, who are the parties to this uh, arrangement. It was uh, negotiated, uh, originally it was uh, started with four and expanded US, uh, US actually expanded it and Japan uh, joined together with Canada. Then uh, for the negotiation, uh, and the negotiation was completed and uh, uh, signed at the end of 19, uh, 2016. And uh, original member is these blue countries with United States, but as you know, United States uh, uh, exited uh, yet January 2017. So currently the member is this blue country and uh, uh, with 11 members. However, in order to actually uh, 
enter into force, each uh, parties need to, to get the treaty ratified uh, in their domestic uh, legal system. And three members still, although it's already three, four years uh, since it entered into force, sorry. But uh, uh, Malaysia, Chile, Brunei are uh, still actually domestic ratification process is ongoing. And today it's November 29th. And therefore, Malaysia will enter into force uh, for Malaysia. It will enter into force officially today. So Malaysia will from, moves from signatories to parties. So it's going to be currently nine parties agreement. Then um, this FTA is in a sense quite uniquely designed. Normally free trade agreement is closed framework. So it is negotiated among certain number of countries, then the benefit will be uh, enjoyed by these uh, participating uh, uh, economies. However, uh, TPP was originally designed as an open type agreement. Therefore, it's open for uh, new accession. And using this provision, so far five new application has been filed, starting with United Kingdom uh, last year, February, followed by China, Taiwan, Ecuador, four applications last year, and, and Costa Rica, uh, Costa Rica uh, this summer. So there are currently uh, five new applicants uh, waiting to join. And out of these five new applicants, uh, accession process is actually happening uh, with United Kingdom. And uh, it's interesting. Uh, other members is just uh, around Pacific area, but uh, UK is applying from uh, Atlantic side, but uh, uh, it's an uh, interesting development. Now, um, this is about uh, a basic fact about TPP, so I won't spend much time, but uh, uh, the reason why we attach special uh, sort of uh, importance to this agreement is, of course, it's mega FTA. Uh, it covers uh, currently uh, around 13% of uh, world GDP and uh, uh, more than 5 million uh, Cooperation in the world, and uh, uh, so it's in a sense a uh, uh, mega agreement. But not only that, the size matters, but also it's uh, a high standard agreement. Therefore, uh, we hope that uh, uh, this can be expanded and uh, somehow uh, reinforce a uh, universal system uh, centering around uh, WTO. And uh, uh, although this is a, a trade economic framework, but it is based on the, the rules of role and uh, as a, a universal uh, values like freedom, democracy, basic human rights and things so on. So we hope uh, this will also somehow expansion of this uh, framework will contribute to, to the, the sort of promotion of universal value beyond the region. And this is... Uh, uh the, the 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 reason why we uh put uh, uh to attach great importance and uh, actually in terms of uh, uh high standardness uh easy way to understand is the level of uh, uh tariff liberalization and uh, um on average TPP uh, tariff liberalization uh, reaches over 99%. Uh, each country have actually, can you, I don't know whether you know, you know how many tariff lines each country have, but roughly 9,200 lines. So even for beef, there are so many lines. And uh, um, then what we do is uh, we negotiate uh, line by line uh, what should be the uh, new uh, tariff rate. And uh, that's why it's sick and time consuming. But uh, nine, over 99% we have liberalized, so uh, eliminated in order to sort of uh, uh, have a, a freer trade. 
so that is uh, one uh, characteristics of this agreement. And that's why actually I'm working currently in the cabinet secretariat, secretariat not in the foreign ministry. Uh, except TPP, when we negotiate a free trade agreement, it's uh, always uh, uh, ministries uh, sort of a collaboration work, foreign ministry, ministry of agriculture, economic ministry, or financial ministry, we, they jointly participate in the negotiation. However, due to the sort of a, a significant impact uh, this particular agreement has, uh, the depth and uh, uh, sort of a uh, uh, wide range of uh, areas which covers, uh, we set up a special organization uh, in the cabinet secretariat, which is above the ministry, existing ministry, so that somehow we can orchestrate uh, some conflict uh, of in interest and uh, uh, can uh, join this agreement. Anyway, uh, this is TPP, and uh, then. Um, you sometimes you hear TPP or TPP 12 or TPP 11 or CPTPP, it's a bit confusing, but uh, uh, TPP was originally uh, well uh, made with 12 countries with United States. So that is this uh, number four uh, original TPP, which has actually 30 chapters uh, covering a whole uh, wide range of areas. And uh, then uh, since unfortunately, uh, currently we don't have United States, but uh, somehow we thought uh, we'd better to make it survive. So we have created uh, another legal framework called CPTTP or TPP 11. And that is this left-hand side, it's only uh, seven articles. It's very short because we basically took all the uh, substantive uh, chapters from TPP we inherited. So, however, we needed to amend some uh, sort of uh, uh, provisions like uh, uh, entering into force and others. Uh, that's how uh, CPTTP uh, exists. So technically, legally, these are two different uh, agreement. And what is in force is this uh, CPTTP currently. And this is the one which uh, five uh, countries, economies have applied uh, at the moment. Then um, I said TPP or CPTTP is high standard rules and uh, uh, this high standardness uh, can be found in various uh, chapters like e-commerce, government procurement, investment, SOE labor, environment. Uh, there are similar uh, region-wide agreement which uh, entered into force uh, after TPP, uh, which is called uh, RCEP, Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement. Um, this is uh, uh, another FTA uh, with ASEAN 10 members plus uh, Japan, Korea, China, Australia, New Zealand. And uh, this is similarly open type, but uh, for example, they don't have the chapter for SOE, state-owned enterprises, labor or environment. So um, sometimes uh, to have uh, uh, obligations uh, in such a broad range of uh, chapters, uh, uh, it's not so easy to su subscribe for. And uh, that is uh, why uh, the, the TPC still uh, remains well, the sort of uh, uh, top uh, high standard uh, legal framework. And I won't go into the detail, but this uh, as slides explains, for example, what is uh, the, the, the uh, uh, characteristic feature of the, the feature of this, uh, uh, for example, uh, in the case of digital trade, uh, what uh, is uh, most advanced uh, uh, in TPP is TPP, in TPP, P, we uh, established three principles uh, for digital trade. And uh, so uh, 
basically a computer server can be set up in any country so our data needs to be transferred across border freely or or the parties shouldn't ask source code uh, to be disclosed uh, for any purposes for allowing investment or others these are the the, the uh, actual uh, content of the agreement now um what uh we are uh, currently doing uh, is uh, uh, within the framework of CP CPTPP is two things. One is expansion, another one is deepening. Um, deepening is, um, CPP is actually a document and uh, it with rights and obligation and with many uh, annexes, tariff schedules and things so on. But, uh, uh, it's not the end of the story. Um, actually, people meet and discuss how to actually uh, deepen the thought or expand uh, the, the, these uh, uh, principles and uh, actual implementation. So we set up 17 committees within this system and uh, people actually have uh, uh, committee meeting and uh, last year uh, we established uh, e-commerce uh, committee to explore uh, because the world of e-commerce, digital economy is uh, every day is keep changing. So to, to uh, up, sometimes we need to update that the, the treaty provision. So we uh, started to explore uh, what should be the challenges or agendas. Uh, and also for green economy is also another important area. And uh, uh, Although this is a trade agreement, uh, we organize various webinars, seminars, and uh, discuss uh, what should be uh, the, the, the uh, agendas and what sort of uh, uh, legal framework would, we could uh, think of, and uh, we are exploring uh, various uh, uh, measures. That is deepening side. Another side is, as I said, uh, it's uniquely open type uh, agreement therefore uh, we need to, to handle this uh, expansion and uh, request for accession now uh the, 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 i want oh, to be uh, sure to get some time for questions so. right, right, yeah sorry yeah i have to finish yeah okay so uh thank you very much for reminding time yeah that's right then uh UK's accession is it's ongoing, and uh, so maybe yeah, uh, I will just uh, uh, if there's any question of what's happening, I will explain it later. And uh, uh, therefore, uh, what we are currently focusing on is uh, for trade framework uh, CPTPP is something, and we are always uh, uh, welcoming uh, US coming back. And of course, we don't, we shouldn't look back, but uh, uh, at the moment, of course, there are uh, various agenda, agendas in each uh, economy. However, uh, there are, technically, there are many ways to, to think of how to, to sort of uh, uh, create new uh, framework or bilateral uh, uh, negotiation is also happening. And, uh, uh, then, of course, uh, we are really welcoming uh, IPEF initiative. So we try to also uh, help solicit US and uh, some other uh, countries uh, to, to expand this framework. And this is uh, uh, where we are now. And uh, one last thing is, so this is where we are heading, but uh, we started also see some, uh, when we look at the inside, uh, some sort of uh, uh, new sort of type of agenda. Uh, we started to see fragmentation of these uh, uh, dual-based uh, sort of principles, and in many parts of the world, right to regulate, uh, which I think uh, when I first uh, came across with this concept, uh, uh, it is actually from the uh, European Union, but uh, how to, to take it. It's the right balance between right to regulate and uh, liberalize is something, and uh, that is also a link to its economic security.
So yeah, uh, I'm, I'm sorry for taking time. Yeah, I stop here and uh, yeah, happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you. That's a great overview of the CPTPP and critical agenda issues comparing across the agreements. And we're really fortunate to have your presentation. I'd like to open up for questions. We have 20 minutes um, and I'm sure there's quite a bit of interest to talk with you all. So first I'd like to go to our associate at the program on US-Japan relations, Keisuke Mito of the Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry who's spending his year at Harvard doing research on innovation policies for small and medium enterprises. Uh, Keisuke, would you like to go ahead and ask your question? Hi, uh, thank you for today's presentation. Uh, it was very interesting for me. Um, I'm Keisuke, uh, a visiting scholar of the US Japan program and from the uh, Japanese uh, METI. And today I am reminded of the important uh, issue or how we can cooperate uh, in developing rules uh, that can balance the new international economic order. On, uh, on this issue, I have a question for both of you. Uh, what have been the most successful policy are to, for balancing the international economic order in the past? excluding the traditional tool, uh, such as a tariff or the trade control. Uh, that's my question, thank you. Erin, would you like to start off? Uh, sure, uh, no, that's a good question. So uh, what works is I think uh, what I'm hearing as the, the question and um, my answer is um, maybe a little bit unexpected, but I, I think the, the quick answer is people and training. Um, the um, uh, nature of uh, companies uh, in business, the nature of administration of uh, governance, uh, if you will, from the government side, uh, cannot happen without people who know what they are doing. Uh, and uh, without uh, people who share uh, basic understandings of um, uh, the issues at hand. And so um, as I reflect on um, certainly uh, the cases of both the United States and Japan, I think some of the most memorable and some of the most uh, successful and enduring programs uh, are those that relate to uh, training and uh, familiarization of countries and their leaders. Um, and so I would point to three examples. Um, I'll let my Japanese counterpart speak for the Japan ones, but uh, I would be remiss if I did not point to the great amount of work that Japan does in Southeast Asia, uh, for example, uh, and with international organizations. And in the case of the United States, um, I would uh, point to both uh, training by private companies, but also government programs. Uh, one of the longest lo uh, serving is the Fulbright program, uh, for example. Um, but uh, more broadly, uh, I think that institutionalizing sharing in some of the work we're doing in government, uh, and I would point to the role of APEC uh, in, in this regard uh, as well for uh, being a forum uh, in non-binding context, that enables uh, officials as well as private sector um, uh, players from countries seeking to join the uh, international order, if you will, uh, to become familiar with it, uh, to build uh, contacts. Those are not perfect answers, but I think that if I had to only one word to answer your question, uh, it would be people. Thank you. Uh, Michi-san, you're muted. Okay, uh, thank you. Yeah, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, yeah, thank you very much. Yes, yeah. Um, yeah, that's a, a tough question. And uh, uh, certainly, yes, as Aronson mentioned, uh, human resource development, uh, yes, yeah, across the sector is important. And uh, maybe um, putting aside, setting aside uh, tariffs, 
of course, uh, exchange rate, yeah, sometimes really, yes, yeah, uh, have more impact, but uh, uh, therefore, tariff is not uh, sort of everything. However, uh, rule setting uh, is something uh, these uh, framework uh, have played a role. And uh, uh, because of these various uh, international framework, I think uh, one great achievement is people no more uh, working on sort of uh, uh, confined uh, within the sovereign state uh, concept and the supply chain uh, network is really, really highly developed. Uh, it's hard to find uh, any product which can be just produced uh, in one country and in uh, among uh, between Japan and ASEAN it rotates several, so many places or in European Union, uh, between UK and Europe, uh, just uh, uh, having a one air aircraft, it's so many parts uh, moving here and there. And uh, so um, I think uh, the, the, these uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, the, the trade framework uh, contributed to, to uh, sort of uh, uh, work uh, beyond the, the, the uh, national boundary. And uh, that was probably uh, one great achievement. Sorry, I'm not, I don't know, because I'm really answering the question. Great, thank you. Thank you so much. And if anyone else in the audience would like to raise their hand while I'm going to ask a question taking the chair's prerogative, but we do have time for a few other questions from the audience. So go ahead and raise your hand if you'd like to ask a question. I would like to ask about economic security, which was a big theme in both of your presentations. And can one reconcile economic security with a rules-based economic order. We want economic security because we realize supply chains are vulnerable, so we need to have some self-reliance. We worry about trading with a country that might be our enemy, so we restrict high technology exports that could have dual use implications. This makes sense. How can you make economic security compatible with a rules-based order? Do countries have to justify why a particular product can be restricted as sensitive? When I studied agriculture, Japan talked about food security and the need to have self-sufficiency in agriculture. And we know that during the pandemic, masks became sensitive and essential. So anything from a semiconductor to a mask to rice could be sensitive and strategic. How are we going to allow countries to protect and build self-sufficiency and restrict trade for economic security? and still have it be rules-based, not discretionary national sovereignty. We decide what we think is security. Uh, I can take a stab at uh, that to start uh, with at least a partial answer. Um, and uh, I think it's a good question. Um, I do think that uh, it's helpful to disaggregate what we mean by, by economic security. And so I hope to do that and then uh, start the conversation. Um, I think that it's uh, that economic security is frankly a term of art. Uh, it's used very widely. Uh, but uh, looking at it from kind of a practical point of view of an official who's trying to get people together, um, it really keys off of what the substantive matter at stake is. If it's going to be about cybersecurity, it's going to be one set of officials and, and private sector players. If it's about food security, it's going to be something else. If it's about um, uh, export controls, it's going to be a very different group uh, of, of individuals. So I think that 
um, in policy terms uh, for, for for analytical clarity, uh, we do need to disaggregate somewhat when we're when we're talking about economic security. Um, the other thing I think that's uh, helpful to understand is that um, I don't think <clears throat> either the United States uh, or Japan are defining economic security as uh, you know um, as uh, self sufficiency necessarily. Uh, certainly not in the way that uh, maybe has been the case in in past. Uh, uh, trade disputes. Um, I think that uh, this is an ongoing conversation uh, in policymaking circles that is by no means done. Um, but uh, I do think that uh, we're placing a very, very high value on relations with uh, trusted partners. And I think that uh, rather than seeing the discussion about economic security being self-sufficiency or global, it is rather um, a question about how to ensure uh, security of X, whether it's food, cyber, uh, with trusted partners. Uh, and uh, so uh, it is a wider discussion than just uh, the nation or the, the, the single sovereign. Um, but it is most definitely not global uh, in the sense of every uh, uh, possible, every country participating uh, or having equal access. And I think that's what's really quite new uh, and is different from the kind of the globalization idea that we would have one standard uh, applicable to all. The unfortunate reality is that some players have not lived up to their commitments and uh, sanctions, export controls, and so forth are a way of uh, excluding uh, that the the players that uh, that don't play by the rules or that uh, that are not honoring their commitments, and so uh, that is, I believe, um, how uh, one might think about it. I would point to an initiative that was announced. We don't have a lot of details yet, but I can tell you the purpose, which is the Mineral Security Partnership. Um, if in the uh, 1970s, uh, the oil-based economy, the center of political risk was in the Middle East, um, the center for political risk in the clean economy it relates to control of either the uh, critical minerals uh, that are input into batteries and, and semiconductors or the processing of them. Uh, and some of that focuses on, on China. And uh, so the Mineral Security Partnership, which uh, Japan, the United States, and several others uh, have formed to try to diversify supplies of processed uh, uh, minerals is an example of working together to try to ensure a secure supply of critical inputs. Uh, there are other examples, but I would put that out for the group as kind of an idea for how we're thinking about the, the new, uh, new world in which you describe. Over. Thanks. And, uh, yes, then, okay. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, yeah, thank you. Um, then, right, yes. Um, if it's, uh, uh, well, uh, economic security, for example, to, to uh, sort of uh, uh, properly respond to the uh, protectionism, uh started to happen right under the COVID-19 situation, uh, do actually uh, based uh, sort of approach can help actually uh, to, to actually counter this movement. And that was, for example, uh, uh, I just uh, uh, added uh, uh, difference material. Uh, uh, in your difference material, uh, the uh, TPP Commission a ministerial statement and uh, which, for example, uh, mentioning, uh, which is a reference that, that we should actually fight against this protectionism uh, use, using this uh, uh, this type of uh, uh, legal framework. But if you actually uh, dig further and depending on the area, uh, there is uh, we the area where we have to really find the balance and. Uh, for example, uh, in one hand, uh, we say free trade uh, is better, uh, but on the other hand, uh, for uh, security reasons, we may want to, to control to some extent. And uh, um, then actually this is where the sort of uh, area, uh, the right to regulate uh, 
could also come in. And uh, so uh, we are, I think this sort of uh, uh, national control uh, is revisiting uh, this uh, sort of, sort of uh, 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 in the world of basically uh, globalism and uh, uh, free trade system. Uh, for example, and, uh, for example, uh, the one slogan, uh, United Kingdom, uh, when the Brexit was decided, one slogan which was often heard is take back control. So, um, so some economies, uh, there is this voice that we'd like to regulate by ourselves. So how, how to hit the right balance? But if we start inserting this kind of right to regulate in the system, that can be used for other purposes as well. So um, free trade and uh, right to, to regulate is always uh, actually that the question which pops up in many fields uh, nowadays. And we have to find the right balance between them. And the uh, United States and Japan, I think, uh, uh, have a sort of a, a common value where we should draw lines. So I think, uh, for example, uh, it would be wonderful if we discuss in the framework of IPEF and uh, come up with uh, a new uh, rules uh, for all this kind of challenges and protect uh, supply chain and others. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, so we must moderate our pursuit of free trade with attention to security and regulatory demands. We also have the question from Shinju Fujihira that's touching on this issue. Aaron Forsberg in the presentation refers to the US middle class and the needs to make trade serve the middle class, which also gets to Michi San's comment just now about the take back our country and this push to make sure globalization works for everyone in the country. But is Japan also facing that same push to make sure trade serves the middle class? And how is that shaping Japan's ability to go forward in negotiations? A second question, Shigeki Moriyama from the Ministry of Finance in Japan and a visiting scholar with our US Japan program asks how the sanctions imposed on Russia and its counter effect on countries that have imposed their economic sanctions are impacting trade negotiations. So do you see the sanctions related to Russia as making a difference for your trade negotiation um, agenda? And last, I have to throw in, you must each say one very brief comment on China's application to join the CPTPP and tell us whether you think there is a route forward in a decade or ever for China to join a rules-based order with high standards. That's a lot to answer in uh, three minutes. So I guess you can pick and choose which part of the question about middle-class interests in trade the Russia sanctions effect on trade and China's application to CPTPP. Um, yes, Michi san, this time you can go first and then we'll end with Aaron. <laughs> but we do okay. need to be brief, so you may not be able to answer. Yeah. All uh, well, I think I shouldn't uh, uh, simplify too much, but uh, well, Japan is basically, yeah, middle class sort of, uh, yes, yeah, society. And I think that that. The liberalization, I think, generally served for the purposes and the companies and the, uh, people. Um, however, uh, it's more like a, a conflict between consumers and the producers. And uh, when we have to protect the domestic producers, so it remains always the case. And uh, so, um, for consumers, it's always good to, to have, yes, yeah, more reasonably priced uh, uh, import products uh, flowing in. But of course, we have to protect, yes, there is always a voice. And uh, so this is always a, a question. Um, sanctions, um, 
well, not direct uh, relations so far because we are not negotiating uh, anything with uh, trade framework with Russia, but uh, indirectly, yes, um, the, uh, we have to be mindful and uh, about this kind of uh, possible uh, uh, protectionism movement and uh, uh but so as far as we are negotiating i think people are tend to be uh to to, to try to uphold this high standardness and uh, rule based uh, things and uh, so uh, but yeah uh, probably it has to be addressed uh, uh, uh in a wider context and that uh, china's accession yes yeah, thank you very much for uh, asking the, the ans simple answer is whether or not they can meet this high standard. Uh, I illustrated some of the sectors, and uh, probably I shouldn't, yes, yeah, uh, uh, to be very too, too flank, but actually uh, they made it difficult because uh, this is no more trade uh, issue uh, because this second applicant telling us that uh we shouldn't allow south applicants so this is no more uh south applicants is uh the, the sort of uh yes yeah we know there is this one china policy but uh, uh wto or cptp uh independent custom territory is uh, uh okay to join and we've uh, formally acknowledged their uh, sort of application uh, request. So, well, these things uh, certainly have made the uh, situation complicated, but the key, key is whether or not they can meet the high sun. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think I think only one of those questions was for me. It was about the the CPTPP and and China, uh, not uh, with the United States not being in the CPTPP. I really don't feel uh, that I I can speak with any authority on that. Uh, I do think with respect to uh, any uh, any negotiations, however, uh, that it's imperative to look at the record of performance, and uh, if we look in regard to. Uh, China, the recent meeting uh, between at the summit uh, level between uh, President uh, Biden and uh, President Xi, uh, there are important differences to manage. We will um, cooperate where we can, but uh, uh, we will also um, push back whether or not uh, there are adherence to uh, commitments uh, or whether there are as active uh, promotion of um, policies which uh, work uh, against our interest or which are uh, um, not uh, not uh, uh, consistent with the values uh, which we seek to promote, uh, whether it's relation in relation to Taiwan or whether it's in relation to, to, to other issues. And so I think that uh, in broad terms, if I were to summarize how the United States is going to evaluate any trade policy, uh, issue it would be uh, that there will be very careful attention, uh, whether it's in regard to China or whether it's in regard to any other country, uh, to the record of performance uh, in relation to uh, commitments made. And I will uh, leave it at that. Thank you very much. This has been a fascinating discussion. I think that um, many of the themes in the past of US-Japan trade policy can inform difficulties going forward about, you know, we never thought of trade policy in isolation from security, but maybe where in the 1950s, the US-Japan negotiations over trade were made easier because we wanted our ally to become prosperous. And the US middle class, as you pointed out in your book, Aaron, may have taken a hit through some of those negotiations that let Japan get an easier deal on textiles or auto, but for grand strategy, that was worth it. Whereas it appears right now in the trade agenda, there's a lot of concern about China that the security side is making it harder to negotiate on trade and holding to a very high standard for the rules that would be necessary to be willing to share open markets. Um, I guess if it makes the US-Japan partnership even more important, that's useful. What do you think, Aaron? Are you willing to extend the analogy to your book as limiting for the China case? 
Well, I think that the uh, shared values and uh, uh, the alliance relationship most definitely provided a structure within which some of the trade issues could be dealt with. Um, but I also think that, uh, and I did write about this in the book, there were there emerged important mechanisms for, de for dealing with the uh, various frictions that arose. Uh, and the scale was at such that uh, it was ultimately manageable, uh, certainly well beyond the period I wrote about. Uh, I do think that uh, we're in a very different era now uh, in respect of uh, challenges we face, not just from, from the People's Republic of China, but also uh, with Russia's conduct. Uh, and so we have to look to new uh, tools to do that. And one of the most important that we have, both of us with our like-minded partners, is alliance and partnership. Uh, we're certainly going to be much stronger uh, in advocating for our interests uh, together uh, than we will be separately. And I think that's certainly one thing that combines or um, crosses uh, the uh, presentations that we both made today. Thank you. Uh, again, I really appreciate the opportunity to share. Great. Thank you both so much. It's really been wonderful to have you share your expertise. And thank you for those in Japan and here in Boston joining in the audience. And thank you to Shin and Jennifer and Sophie for organizing the event. Okay, yeah. Thank you. Thank pleasure you to meet you. Yes. Thank you very much.